with uh, Fadi and uh, Felipe is coming in a second. And uh, here he comes. So we can start sitting down. And uh, so we're going to talk about uh, the digital world. We're going to talk about citizenships, about city cities, and about governance. And uh, we have really two amazing persons uh, to discuss everything with. So here is Felipe. Uh, he's uh, the founder of uh, Serenade d'Amour. Uh, sorry for my pronunciation. <laughs> And uh, we have Fadi, a former CEO of ICANN, that is the authority that uh, governments the internet somehow. And uh, now they're going to explain us better uh, a little bit what their job actually is, what are their projects and their ideas. And then we'll have a little chat also uh, with you. So this panel will be also open to your questions in a second moment. So we hope to really have a bit of interaction. So uh, let's start with uh, Fadi. So, wait, I give you a microphone maybe? <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. So Thank you, Ivan. Tell us about uh, your work uh, and what do you do, uh, what you did in ICANN and what you are doing now. Okay. Um, thank you, Ivan. Hello, Felipe. It's good to be with all of you. Uh, I was commenting that the last time I was uh, here was almost 40 years ago. Uh, so it's quite a flashback for me to come back here today. Um, I'm happy to share with you a little bit of experience about the digital world. First of all, I must thank the organizers of this conference for this wonderful theme that we are talking about cities and local governments are going to be the future of governance. There is no question about it. And I think uh, the theme and the word co-governance is such a powerful concept. And it's one that leaders of the world need to learn about. Uh, I will start by explaining to you a little bit why I think digital is relevant to your subject. The inventors of the internet, Dr. Vint Cerf and uh, Bob Kahn, who were all in my city in Los Angeles at UCLA inventing the first protocols of the internet, when they invented it, they made sure that IP numbers, which are the numbers that make the internet work, do not have a nation or state or national boundary. IP numbers are not national. IP numbers are not international. IP numbers are transnational. They do not understand national boundaries. And hence, the digital world is the first world that challenges the nation-state boundaries and the legal jurisdictions that have existed for the last two centuries. It is a world that changes the game. Let me start by sharing with you some basics, because many people don't know how the digital world is governed. So let me start by sharing with you this chart, which will help at least explain how the digital world is governed. The digital world can be divided into three layers. You see them here in the colors green, orange, and blue. The green layer, I'm going to call it the infrastructure layer. Today, this is made up of about 77 
thousand networks. These are the networks that run the internet. Those networks are distributed. They're owned by many companies like AT&T in the US or France Telecom or China Telecom. They own these networks. Most of them are owned by private companies. Connected to those networks today are 25 billion things. By 2030, we expect that number to be one trillion things, including my eyes, my heart, everything in this room, every light, everything will be connected to the internet. This is what we call the internet of things. But it's not just things, it's people, it's biological infrastructures. Everything will be connected to this green layer. Now, the orange layer is what makes all these things appear to be one internet. Because I just told you there are 77,000 networks and 25 billion things, trillion soon. How do they all look like one internet? because of the orange layer. This is the layer that I had the privilege of managing for four years. This is what makes the internet look like one internet. That orange layer is made up of all the numbers, the digital numbers, which are all stored in what we call the root of the internet. The root of the internet has 13 instances in the world and I was responsible to secure those 13 things. It was the most attacked system on the planet because if those 13 systems are down, the entire digital world stops. And those 13 things, two are in Europe, 10 are in the United States, and one is in Japan. And we guard them very carefully. But those are the things that make the internet look like one internet. So if you type www.ibm.com, anywhere in the world, you always go to the one machine that is called ibm.com. That's what this orange layer does. Now, who governs the green layer? Ministries of Telecom. That's who governs this. Companies that run those internet. Who governs the orange layer? The orange layer was governed by an institution that I ran called ICANN, which is governed by all of us. It is the first transnational institution in the world that is governed by the people and the governments and the businesses. Essentially, it is co-governed. And today, at Harvard and at Oxford government schools, they teach how co-governance of transnational layers is working. It's a tremendous achievement of humankind. Today, however, I will go to the blue layer. This is the layer you are familiar with. We all live in the blue layer. This is the media, governments, the internet, the web, pardon me, not the internet, the web. The web lives in the blue layer. And we have the good web and the dark web. It's all up there. By the way, for those of you who don't know what is the dark web, the web that you access today is only one-fifth of the real web. Four-fifths of the web is not visible to most of you. That is what is called the dark web or the deep web, which is separate. There's a lot going on in the digital space, and it's all happening up there. And I will finish this slide by asking you, who governs this layer? So I told you who governs the green layer. Who governs the orange layer is this organization run by all stakeholders called ICANN. But who governs the blue layer? And the answer to this question today is nobody. Nobody. And hence the problem. We have a major global issue now 
of who governs the digital lives. I'll give you two examples. I was just in Seattle, and I met with people, one of them Italian, actually, who work for Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos, who uh, runs Amazon. And those gentlemen just invested $1 billion to build 152 satellites that will soon go around the Earth that will take live video of every square centimeter on the planet 24 hours a day. And the question is, who will govern this video stream? Who will have access to it? What will be the rules? And you ask these two, frankly, wonderful gentlemen, Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos, who are, you know, learned people. And you say, you just put $1 billion towards this initiative. What is the plan? Who will you answer to as it regards to the use of these powerful videos? These are big questions, and there are no clear answers. But we are entering now a phase where all of us have to participate in that answer. And I will finish by giving you beautiful hope as to what's possible. I had the opportunity to meet with the Antonio Guterres, who is the Secretary General of the United Nations at a private event. And I shared with him my concerns about who governs this layer. And our Secretary General, who is a very committed spiritual person, by the way, immediately said, I want you, Fadi, to come and meet all the heads of the UN organizations in the world. I spent five hours with all of them, the head of UNESCO, the head of, and we shared with them the concerns we have about this. And the head of the UN, Antonio, immediate, who, by the way, doesn't like to be called anything but Antonio. If I called him Secretary General, he asked for me to pay a fine. Uh, Antonio said, uh, we will form a panel to start studying how we can change the governance into the digital space to affect all governance. And we formed a panel that is headed by Jack Ma, the founder of Alibaba, and Melinda Gates, the wife of Bill Gates, Vint Cerf, the inventor of the internet, myself and many others have formed a panel. We're meeting in Geneva on Monday to actually start thinking of a co-governance model and a set of mechanisms that allow us as people of the world, civic, public, and private leaders, and citizens, to shape a governance for the new era. And this is very important. My last word to all of you as I pass the microphone to my colleague Felipe, who has it wonderful story to share with you, by the way, about his commitment to this. Uh, I was sharing with one of the kind people who picked me up this morning from Rome that there are, there's a moment now in the digital world where we're seeking to put humanity back at the center of the digital revolution. Because in many ways, we are more connected than ever but we are also more disconnected than ever. It's fascinating. Watch how many dinners you attend where young people are all sitting, having a meal with their phones, not with the people around them. We're connected. We're more connected than ever, and we'll become more connected than ever as biological and physical infrastructures become all on the net. However, Man and humanity has been removed from this equation somehow. And what happens when we meet like we are now happens less and less. And the exchange of maybe at the spiritual level or at the human level, whatever you like to call it, is missing. And I think we're seeing now a resurgence of interest. In fact, in the Silicon Valley, we now have something called human-centric digital design finding man again in this digital ocean we all live in.
So I look forward to a dialogue with you, and I invite you to listen to my colleague, Felipe, as well. Yes. Thank you very much, Fadi. I think uh, it's really uh, very, it's very important, uh, this theme of governance, especially of this uh, third layer. And uh, one thing that we can start is to measure what we see. And here comes in uh, Felipe. Uh, so Felipe, you started this great project and uh, tell us a bit about uh, where you come from and what are you doing exactly? All right, it's, it's okay, okay. Uh, well, first I want to thank um, Flavio Del Pozo and Leticia Del Torre. Uh, because of them, I, it's possible for me to be here. So if you like the presentation, if you like the project, it's because of them. If you don't like it, I am Philippe Cabral, and I want to talk about products that empower democracy. So I think this li the slider is here. All right, democracy. I'm born on it, and I'm planning to die on it. I think it's the only system that uh, make uh, it possible to every one of us to have a voice, to have rights, to have forum like this, and to co-create stuff. Right? Uh, it's made it possible to us to be here, right? And democracy have a lot of flaws, a lot of loopholes, a lot of uh, possibilities to um, to unbalance power between the the powers, people, and everything else. It's possible to hijack the power uh, using the flaws of democracy. Uh, one, one of those flaws are uh, very well known uh, by Cambridge Analytica that helped a lot of things to happen. I think everyone uh, learned about Brexit or the, or the uh, populism age that's happening right now and all the lies that's happening through the internet and manipulation and hacking of human psychology through the analysis that computer does and filter and profile us. And well, democracy has been uh, exploited for many, many years. <laughs> and this is the new cloth of it. But the problem that we are facing now, uh, that uh, we have a, a democracy is shrinking right now. Second, uh, the economist intelligence units that uh, make public a white paper about uh, democracy index all around the world for every country. Uh, we, are have a, we have a shrink democracy year by year. So one thing that we are take as granted as democracy, I born on it, right, is made this possible. And we are losing it right now. Like it's, it's, it's probably will not possible in the future. So I think the, the time to act, to support it, it's right now. And well, if the new clothes that exploit the, the, uh, the democracy right now, Cambridge Analytica, intelligence artificials, big data profiling, uh, human manipulation, uh, it's make to, uh, we have this uh, technology right now to exploit democracy, but we don't have, it would, would be wonderful if we have something to support democracy, to reinforce their pillars, so we can share, uh, so we can co-create a uh, platform that do not divide us or try to sell things to us, right? And, well, this is very, very hard because to have knowledge to create digital products that have impact, it's very difficult. Uh, please don't get me wrong, but uh, social good organizations don't talk nerd. It's a specific uh, language, it's, it's a lot of jargon. Uh, people are different, like a fun fact, uh, Vice News have made public that FBI have a lot of dif uh, difficulties to hire uh, computer specialists because they uh, smoke weed going to the interview. So it's uh, crazy people, are, it, it's a different language, uh, they are millennials, they are different, right? And we need to understand how they think, how to translate the communication, how to create human-centered design, and how to uh, use compu uh, computation to, to have more resource to create more products. Uh, it is possible, it's possible to overcome all this, co-creating stuff, being together, uh, talking, 
right? It's possible. It's, uh, it's made possible in the past. And I want to talk about that. Two years ago, I started Operação Serenata de Amor. It's Serenade of Love, a love serenade. Uh, the name has two major reasons. Uh, one, it's a candy, it's a chocolate in Brazil. Uh, it's a small thing, it's very well known. And it's based, uh, it's because of the Toblerone case. In Sweden, one public person have bought one Toblerone with public money. And this, that, that person pays for that until today. And we want to create something that will go so down at a deep level in, the, in the detail that can take a chocolate bar. And also, uh, with the name of this chocolate in Brazil, it's also our love serenade to Brazil because it's made for, uh, uh, with the public support, right? Uh, everything from the crowdfunding, from the support, for the communication, for the exposition on media, everything. And this is, uh, it started uh, taking the uh, expenses of the minor house and the Senate in Brazil are more than 2 million uh, expenses and 20,000 new every month. So it's a Herculean job to do. I, I don't think uh, there's any digital audit in the world that's taken that. Uh, the, the big five of the auditing always create something, but not on, on that level or public level that it's very hard to, um, to have a public power or a public person to create something that can create danger to them. Well, we create uh, Rosie. Rosie is a, this intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence, that makes uh, two things. There's a lot of uh, analytical uh, on, on top of that. So if someone from one state fly to the capital of Brazil but fill a, a gas tank in another state, we need to cross information with the partners of enterprise and found that the congressperson is a partner of enterprise of another state and he used public money to fill the tank of his uh, office. Uh, uh, of, uh, 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 it's, it's like... Uh, 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 exactly. So it's, he's, he's using personal, uh, public money for personal use for his uh, personal enterprise and a lot of different things. And uh, the, the code is open, uh, it's open for everyone, and it's possible to see that we also create some uh, mechanism that make machine learning with supervision. So every suspect and everything is uh, the computer's learning how Brazilians, uh, how congressperson in Brazil act and have made mis misuse of money. And there are some numbers, like, and it was funny because we almost break the official communication channels of the Chamber of Deputies with, the, with those, no, those numbers. And to public see what is happening, uh, the whole information, the cross of information, we create a dashboard called Jarbas. And uh, there's, uh, I didn't take a lot of pictures, but it's possible we p uh, put some Google Maps images, uh, the expenses that happen at the same month, people around it, every Every uh, paper trail of public money that happened, we put together and it's possible to, uh, to be seen. So any person in Brazil or around the world, because if you www.serenata.ai, you can follow it. You can see uh, the suspicions, what is happening, and help a lot of Brazilians, journalists, and different people to, to check that. Uh, after we broke the Chamber of Deputies official channel, they start hearing us. So I said, all right, I will not reply to you anymore. Like, no, that's too much. And with this official reply, we create a communication robot at Twitter that put everything online every day. <laughs> uh, because, well, we need to hack the system. Is this, if, if the system does not work, we need to think as hackers, as white hat hackers, and communicate and create a service for the pu public. Uh, those are some numbers. Uh, we have uh, almost 800 volunteers that work with us, that discuss technology with us, that create together. Uh, the Facebook page have almost uh, 70,000 people. We are the major open source, political open source public on Latin America. And after two years, we can see, because we work with data, 
that uh, congressperson using the specific uh, expense start behaving themselves. So we did it. We did it. Uh, without this uh, success, another ideas, another uh, kinds of organizations start uh, coming together with us. And uh, all right, oh, it's working. It's a gift. So this is a political profile. Uh, we put together almost 50 different data sets and make a visualization of everything that we have in every political person in Brazil. So if you change a uh, public, uh, public party, uh, your um, attacks in common, your rich, if you become richer or not, along your political career, everything that we got, we made public. So people can ask questions like, how many are women? like in, in, the, uh, in the political of Brazil. There are a lot of questions that are already answered for er anyone. Uh, so this was created uh, as a tool for journalism. So it's very easy for us to access public data or to grab public data by force and create official channels of communication. Uh, with the rise of populism, uh, uh, and there's a lot of cases happening in Brazil right now, the president says something, and two days after, he does some different things. And this creates a, a liar layer that is difficult to navigate inside Brazil. But official channels cannot lie, and, cannot, and sometimes cannot take back their word. And it's possible to create a lot of tools for journalism, and w with partners of journalism, the uh, uh, political profile has been made, is made possible with the Intercept that work with us. So it's needed, I need it as a nerd, to have other people with me to think and to co-create. Uh, the last project inside Serenata de Amor is the uh, official Gazette or public Gazette, uh, Diários Oficiais. Uh, the Gazette, uh, Brazil have 5,570 municipalities. Each one create one Gazette every day. Uh, there's a lot of corruption that can hide in plain sight with the public, uh, public information. It's impossible for a human being to audit all these things. Uh, we are grabbing uh, the, for the first 100 major cities, and this will be enough da data to start a uh, training computer to understand uh, justice jargon and difference between people. So, if you're talking about something, uh, something without using the specific words, it still be possible to computer to, to understand what is being saying. So if, it's, if a Brazilian uh, politician wants to come to Europe using a first class and uh, being in luxury using um, public money, it will be easier for us to understand in cities, classifying and made public. Uh, well, there's a lot of things happening. Uh, we, we landed like the, the prime time at Sunday night. The, the major news in Latin America was wonderful experience to, to be well known. Um, I don't know if I have said before, but we made all this work is public. So every dime that we made it from it, it's made public, where it's gone. Uh, there's a, every month there's a, there's a full report on it. The code is open and uh, public on the cop left of the MIT uh, copyright law that says that it's public, everyone can copy, everyone can make a copy and edit, anyone can take a copy and make a product and profit on it and we are not, and we can't do anything about it. So it's a love serenade to everyone, like it's here, you can use this technology for anything that you want. And well, with this huge success that happened. Other organizations start uh, talking uh, with us. Uh, the last example is the Brazil Institute of Criminal Science. We call IBCCRIM. And there are two amazing projects. The first is the democratizing the public management of justice. Uh, ju judges in Brazil are freaking huge elite. They're grabbing power. And one researcher uh, have found evidence that fake, fake can manipulate the system to leverage and unbalance the power between justice, executive, and legislative. And with this researcher, we are uh, creating something to 
hack and take the data because processes in Brazil are open, but there is a lot of capture, there's a lot of difficult to take this data, so it's not uh, really open data. But we're making it. We're going to make it. Uh, and this will prove in every state of Brazil how judges are, uh, are protecting themselves and, using, uh, and manipulating the system to, to, uh, to be more powerful, powerful. And as I said before, I, don't like, I like to live in a democracy. Uh, the second one is the spotlight for draft legislation. With all the lies and everything that's happening in Brazil, it's difficult to, to see. And a lot of times we can see that uh, legislation is approved or changed in the middle of the night or something that happened with the big news and no one is checking uh, the, the legislators and they, they do something, they approve something. And this new system, uh, the Spotlight for Draft Legislation, we will inform you about any subject of legislation that you want. I have a lot of keywords that make some subjects that you can uh, check and receive by SMS or email on your phone. And I think this is a, a great thing because if you have this kind of information, uh, like a small edit, like uh, uh, labeling a social movement as a terrorist or something like that, that's never been a terrorist for the last 40, 40 or 50 years, uh, you can receive information and you can de uh, develop a personal leadership and we can create new uh, politician uh, leaderships in these small groups, like w we can do that. It's possible receiving official information from the legislation direct on your device. Um, I, I, I don't know if you want to know more, but if you, know, if you want to know more, there's a lot of channels uh, and I open to talk about it. It's impossible for me to, to hack the whole democracy of the world. I need partners. And if you need any kind of information, uh, you can talk to me in the, in the, on the plane, in Twitter, or send me email. It's open source, and I will be open for you anytime. Uh, and I, want, uh, I need to thank you. A lot of organizations that make that, uh, the, the whole thing uh, possible. Open Knowledge Brazil, Brazil Institute of Criminal Science, Python, the developers community that welcomed the the, ho the whole 800 uh, people. Digital Ocean that support the servers so we can work. Data Science Brigade where e everything started, uh, the first ideas, e everything. And there's a Brazil for the uh, perfil político. Thanks for your patience. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Really, thank you to both of you. So, uh, you know, these are uh, very um, fascinating things, and especially uh, they gave, gave us a very global angle, because, of course, uh, also if uh, Felipe talked about Brazil, as he said, democracy is really needing help in all the world. So, uh, this panel, we, are, we want to focus a little bit on cities, so on how we can use uh, mm, rules, co-governance, uh, web tools and everything to uh, enforce cities and empower citizens. So let's start with the first video. Primo video. C'era... No, c'è un video. Okay, so uh, 
most of the population of the world lives in cities. The cities are always bigger, they are megalopolis, a lot of things are happening there and uh, they are getting smarter. So uh, we have a smart grid, we have a smart parking, we have uh, a ton of sensors. Uh, uh, they say, okay, they will be helping citizens and they will be helping governments. So uh, wha which do you think are the technologies that most are going to help cities empower the normal life? So the everyday life of citizens and uh, mm, what do uh, you think are the big problems that we can uh, see and also the opportunities? Yeah. Oh, all right, I have the microphone, so I will start it. Um, how does the whole thing will impact our lives in the cities, right? Um, we are already experimenting a lot of different things, like uh, lines for uh, services, like uh, our health information is in a lot of places already cent centralized. So it's possible to, to keep your things with you without a lot of backpack or uh, need to, to be worried about your stuff. So it's one thing. There's a lot of uh, services that are already being created like uh, for co-creation of information about the society. Like things like oh, uh, I, you can inform the public service with your, your uh, handheld device. Taking pictures, talk about things. Uh, it's not about just communication or using social media. Like we can talk with, with uh, our representatives. We can use official channels to talk and create the city, the relation with the city. Uh, and this is an amazing thing in a, in a lot of different ways. Uh, like you, uh, every time that I need to take a train, I need I check online if the train is later or not. So I can just have more minutes with my dog at my house or not, just checking with my, uh, my cell phone. So the, the impacts are, uh, Technology is so advanced right now and helping so much that it's, it's, it's almost difficult to grasp the whole thing. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm telling th uh, things that I, I think is a common sense with techno technology, but we need to, to like make fantasy of it. We need to read fiction and try to cre uh, make reality of it. Uh, so we can have uh, a real demo democracy and using services, public services, and using public relations to be empowered, to have a relations, to have mini meaningful relations. Um, th there's a movement called Tic Tac, uh, Technology for Civic, uh, for Civic Engagement, that's happening around the world. And there's a lot of things that uh, is still possible, like uh, trying to understand the um, firefighter force around the world and we never think about that, right? So we can analyze the data, who is better, uh, who, who, can, who can I learn from, right? Things that we can co-create and, and, and make everything, uh, the life easier. Thank you, Felipe, and thank you, Ivan, for the question. Look, I think the technology is going to penetrate every aspect of every city. It'll penetrate life's uh, society, the economy, the environment. It will. If it hasn't already, it will. But we're just at the beginning, by the way. Many of us think that this is done, as Felipe was giving us some examples as a fellow technologist, I'm thinking of all the possibilities that are yet to come. We haven't seen yet. We don't even understand yet. I recall with, uh, with a little bit of fun, my dad telling me that when the train first arrived to some cities in Upper Egypt, where my parents are from, the villagers would come out to the train station convinced that they will invite the train to come and have lunch with them because to, to honor the train the first time it comes to the city. Uh, it could be a funny story, but we're just at the beginning. We're still all of us greeting technology like it's this strange thing coming into our lives, and we don't know yet what it will do. We really don't. So what role could we play today to get ready for what we don't know? That's the question. 
Many of you here are officials in cities. You have responsibilities. Here's what I think we could do. I think we should adopt the concept that we don't want smart cities. We want living cities. Because there will be a lot of smarts in every city. We can't stop it. You and I cannot stop the advance of technology. It's coming. There will be investments by companies sitting in Ukraine that affect the lives of a citizen in Cairo. There is no boundary. The ability of governments to actually control the digital penetration of the economy and society in their jurisdictions has become very limited. The only way governments will be able to truly have some level of control is if that control is bottom-up, not top-down. Now, I'll give you a good example of this. Recently, one of the biggest digital companies in the world, Google, engaged in an activity which many of us may have opinions about. But if you, all of us in this room, had a negative opinion of that decision by this company, what can we really do? What can all of us do? Very little. You know who changed Google's mind? It's employees. A bottom-up action from within this company changed the, the big decision made by the leaders of that company. Now, we could take that example and apply it to cities. After all, Google and all the big companies need us as their customers. Let's not forget that. So it starts with the citizen. The closest governance structure to the citizen is the city, is the municipality. In Europe, there is a legal term called subsidiarity, which is bringing down the legal policy making to the closest point where the customer is or where the citizen is. Subsidiarity, it's a very big term in actually the formation of the European Union. And I think the same should apply to the digital world. In fact, one of the principles we are suggesting to the Secretary General as part of a new digital regime or a new digital mechanism of governance is subsidiarity, bringing things down to the city level, to the most local level. And therefore, to make our cities living, we need to start with the citizen, listening to them, taking their voice, and lifting their voice from the bottom up to the top. That is more effective, in my opinion, moving forward given how little power has been left to the top-down governance that has ruled the world for so many years. So it's a moment, and I hope cities grab it to make their cities living cities. Thank you very much. So, uh, other important issue in cities is security. So uh, we have it in series, we have a lot of technology going on, maybe the second video can give us a better, better look at this. So uh, this is part of the, I think, uh, the discussion uh, where people think, okay, technology is good, technology is everything, but it can be very scary. 
uh, because uh, those technologies are out there. We have uh, drones, we have uh, robots, uh, and uh, yes, they are intelligent, uh, uh, but of course, uh, they are always made and controlled by people. I remember an AI scientist and entrepreneur that said uh, she was building a sensor to help uh, um, all people to not fall. And uh, she did a lot of experiments, and uh, the algorithm uh, learned it was perfect. But uh, suddenly uh, she saw that it worked just for men, not for women because she was in an engineer faculty and uh, all the persons that tested the, and uh, trained the algorithm were men, not women. So she as a woman created an algorithm that was sexist. <laughs> and she was like, what have I done? And uh, she never thought of that because she was just creating something to help people. She was not uh, uh, thinking uh, the ethics behind uh, AI in that case. Uh, when we come to security, what happens? Uh, you talk a lot in your speeches uh, about uh, self-government, about auto-regulation, and um, how can this work in cities? How can cities and governments auto-regulate themselves, and how the private sector and the civic sector can help on this? Thank you, Ivan. Security in the digital world is very, very difficult. Very difficult. Uh, Vince Cerf, who designed TCP IP, which is the core protocol of the internet, tells me that in the early days when they were designing the internet, they had a fork in the road. They had to decide if they were going to make the protocols more secure or more open for collaboration. And their mandate, their requirement, was to build the internet at the time as a tool for collaboration. So they made it more open, i.e. less secure, by design. Today, they didn't anticipate that the internet will be used for everything. <laughs> they did not anticipate that. And so the internet was not designed to be a very secure platform. But today it is used for everything. I tell my family and people I care about, all of you count there, that privacy, which we all seek in the digital world, is dead. There is no privacy. For those of us, Felipe and Ivan and me, and many of you who are technologists, we know there is nothing private, nothing. You saw in the video faces being uh, looked at, studied. Increasingly machines will be running these algorithms, not humans. And those machines, uh, how they were built, as you mentioned, is, has biases and has different decision-making built into the machine, which now will learn from itself so that in 10 years, we don't know how the machine knows what it knows. So please accept for yourselves that security <laughs> is really almost gone. Now, what do we do to be positive? Let's think a little bit. What can we do? Well, the first thing we can do, as Ivan mentioned, I made speeches about this, is first to take personal responsibility. The first thing we should do is not feel that we are powerless. We actually have a voice in this because those companies that are purveying all that technology, after all, need our data. Facebook currency is our data. That's how Facebook lives. If Facebook didn't have your data every time you went on the internet, they could not have sold it to Cambridge Analytica and made money. So data is the fuel of the digital century. But data comes from you and me. We need to start raising the awareness of people, starting in our cities, that we have digital rights. Human rights 
should include digital rights. Prince Zaid, who ran the UN Human Rights Commission, and I were chatting about the importance of adding our data rights to our Declaration of Human Rights, because your data is being used to create not just wealth, but power around the world. So that's a small example of one place where cities can start creating data commons and actually having their citizens maybe finance their projects to build new infrastructure by exchanging the data of citizens in large cities with the big companies they needed to make even more money. But at least let's make data a currency. Let's make it something that we have not just control of, but we can benefit of as a city, as a community. So that's one example of many ways. We don't have the time to go through many examples today, but there are many ways we can take control of the fact that security is gone. And I'll finish by giving you this thought to make you think about this. When people get worried, as I heard somebody gasp in the audience uh, when I say privacy is dead, I tell them that we should focus less on security, we should focus more on integrity. Data integrity is the new idea we should all be thinking about. Meaning, when somebody publishes something online about Fadi, how do you know it's true? So now we need technologists like Felipe to start using technology to increase the integrity of data. So when we look at something, we actually have a way forensically to decide that this is good data with high integrity. I think that's a higher order concern that cities and governments should focus on more than security, which I believe is all but fleeting. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, we're almost running out of time. So uh, I would like to open uh, to some questions of the audience uh, and uh, don't know if there are or you are already too hungry. No, okay, there are questions. <laughs> okay, maybe we can bring a microphone there. Thank you, thank you all so much. We'll jump right into the questions because we have very little time before lunch. Uh, I just ask you all to get your headsets on for translation and Katarina will let you know your languages, your numbers. And for everyone else who has a question, we're only going to take maybe two or three. Um, just your name uh, and the language you're going to speak, maybe what country you come from. Uh, and then just wait two or three seconds because there's going to be a little bit of a gap for the translators to get ready. Okay, so we'll come down to you now. Okay, my name is Lucia Stasalova. I will speak in Slovak. <laughs> Slovak. Uh, ja by som sa chcela opýtať otázku, uh, či uh, m, pri tom absolútnom stransparentňovaní procesov, napríklad pri príprave zákonov a legislatívy, uh, ste narazili na teóriu, že čím Väč, čím viac slnka, tým e, väčší tieň a že naozaj niektoré rozhodovania e, jednoducho nepatria na verejnosť kvôli tomu, že nie sú definitívne a že tie procesy sú ukryté preto, aby nevzbudzovali veľké emócie a pochybnosti a výsledky sú dôležité pri tvorbe napríklad politik a legislatív. Felipe, you want to start? <laughs> I think I can. If I, it's it's. Uh, I don't know if I get right, but it's a question about transparency, right? Uh, hmm. I think it is is nice to to start talking about uh, some organizations that are helping the governments to be more transparent. 
is the case of uh, OGP, Open Government Partnership, that have the full, is, full support of the World Bank. And the World Bank uh, enforces transparency in, in a lot of different countries. So if, uh, if someone tried to shut down the internet or the transparency, they're gonna pay uh, without the support of the World Bank, and that will be a terrible uh, scenario for any country. Um, so I am very positive about the openness because we need cooperation. We talk about uh, the need of cooperation in the last days. Um, and the governments need to be open, need to, to exchange. And the transparency, it's, uh, it's a way that we are not turning back. We cannot uh, close the door anymore. We will be transparent with the government data and everything else. Uh, uh, we always can check the uh, Open Knowledge International that have open index that measure a lot of different um, uh, kind of data and if it's ready or not to be used by the public. And there's a ranking by countries and everything else. And it's a very nice repository to check about that. And uh, Open Knowledge International have a lot of different chapters around the world. So it would be nice to talk with your, uh, with your chapter or just put on Google transparency organization name of your country, find it, send an email to, to them, put me on copy, and then start a conversation what kind of possibilities that we can do. Okay, let's go with another question. Sorry. Hi, uh, Nicolas Golray, je vais parler en français. Euh, J'aimerais avoir votre euh, opinion sur la possibilité de, pour l'humanité, vous disiez que le monde digital euh, n'a que faire des frontières euh, et que c'est un fait désormais. Et donc euh, j'aimerais avoir votre opinion sur la possibilité d'officiellement euh, créer un système en parallèle du système actuel qui puisse coexister avec le système actuel qui soit basé sur un système de valeurs, qui soit basé sur, officiellement sur une application euh, ouverte à tout le monde et qui soit le bien commun de l'humanité, qui ne soit pas appartenu par Facebook ou qui que ce soit, que ce soit le bien commun de l'humanité, avec une monnaie, qui soit le bien commun de l'humanité, et qu'on puisse commencer à s'organiser, euh, quel que soit notre lieu dans le monde, euh, à travers cette application, euh, en se référant à ce système de valeurs, en utilisant cette monnaie et cette application, euh, je crois que nous avons désormais toutes les pièces du puzzle pour le faire et j'aimerais avoir votre opinion là-dessus. Marabi You are right that uh, all the pieces of the puzzle to create a... I don't want to call it just an alternate system, but maybe... Uh, another optional system for people to have uh, access to a, a digital world that maybe has a system of values as well. I think that's what you're seeking. Uh, here's the good news. The internet enables what you said. So the very technology that we fear is the same technology that will solve the problem. And you saw in many ways, Felipe uses the technology to a maximum to solve a different problem. Um, so technology in itself is not a force for good. Neither is it a force for evil. It's how we use it. So it, at the end of the day, depends on us. You propose a potential different system. I will tell you that there is a movement now, even within Silicon Valley, of people who think like you, who are saying, we should use our power for the good. I mentioned in a prior discussion this morning with another group here, that one of the CEOs of the largest companies in the Valley, in fact, the company that takes the most images from the sky of the planet every day. 
they photograph the planet every single day. Uh, in fact, they photograph it about 20 times a day, producing six terabytes of image data per day. This company is actually considering the idea of becoming a common good. This is a big company, multi-billion dollar company, considering converting their power into a common good power by sharing their images for good. For example, uh, they started informing the Brazilian government in real time of where uh, trees are coming down in the Amazon illegally because they can take images all the time of every single tree in the Amazon. And their artificial intelligence systems are tracking who's bringing down trees. And they're checking into the government systems which are open, who has a permit to take down a tree. And if there is no permit corresponding to the tree, within about three nanoseconds, they send an email to the official in Brasilia responsible for that. So here's companies using their power for good. It is possible. And I hope, again, it starts with us. Uh, so your idea is not far-fetched. It's actually a great one.